I'm a zoologist. Like all zoologists, I study animals. And as many zoologists have found, I found the animals of Australia are the most fantastic, the most unique animals in the whole world, which is why I want to spend the rest of my whole life studying these creatures. I was born in Australia, but I spent about 20 years overseas getting an education, studying animals that are definitely very different than Australian animals, and thinking that was all there was to the world till I came back here, and somebody put a kangaroo in my lap, I was hooked. I'd never seen anything as beautiful or as fascinating or as different as that magnificent thing with a pouch. They gave birth to tiny little babies, things that you're going to see in this film that will stun and amaze you. If you are not familiar with marsupials, you're going to see some amazing sights. But it's not just marsupials that make Australia and New Guinea unique in terms of the animals that they have. We have also the only mammals here that lay eggs. They're fur-bearing animals like other mammals, but they give birth to eggs like reptiles and birds. That's a totally unique, totally bizarre, and utterly fascinating way of life for a mammal. And of course, there are other things besides even the egg-laying mammals. There are gigantic reptiles. We have some of the most ferocious crocodiles anywhere in the world. If you still want to see the best approach you can get to a living dragon, you've got to see some of Australia's gigantic saltwater crocodiles. This land, it really is extremely unique. I think what you're going to see in this film by filmmaker John Shaw are, are some of the most spectacular scenes that you've ever seen of animals. They're all natural, none of them are faked. They are precisely the animals as they're doing their thing in the bush, which is what makes them so special. This is a unique film and you're in store for a unique experience. Let's start with koalas. Just before the arrival of Europeans, koalas probably lived over a wide area of eastern Australia. They are now found only in isolated patches of open forest. There are three races of koalas. The ones in the tropics are quite small, with short, light gray fur and an average weight of about six and a half kilograms, or 14 pounds. In the colder south, they are much larger and the males can grow up to 75 centimeters, or about two and a half feet. Their fur is darker and longer and has a reddish tinge. The third type fits in between these two. Koalas are beautifully adapted to life in the trees. Two of the toes of the forepaws are opposed to the other three. This, plus long claws, gives them a firm grip on tree branches, and sometimes they need it. A koala can also lift its arms above the shoulder, a great advantage to an animal that lives in trees. Apart from the primates, monkeys and apes and man, koalas are the only animals able to do this. Although they sit on moving in trees for long periods, they can move about the bush either by jumping from branch to branch or by climbing down and walking along the ground. At the first sign of danger, they can show a pretty good turn of speed. They can even swim, slowly of course, and normally they only do this when it's necessary for survival, such as during floods. Koalas are mainly nocturnal, but during the day they'll move around in a gum tree, feeding on the leaves, stalks, and sometimes on bark. In Australia, there are 528 species of eucalyptus or gum trees, but koalas are only known to eat from 40 species, while probably less than 20 make up most of their diet. There are a few folk tales about koalas in Australia. One is that they have a six-foot appendix. The other is that they never drink. The first is correct, because gum leaves are so hard to digest Koalas have a two meter long appendix that contains microorganisms that digest the leaves through a process of fermentation. Even the oils are absorbed and koalas smell strongly of eucalyptus. But the other story is not correct. Koalas do take water, but get most of this from gum leaves, although they do occasionally drink. Koalas are territorial animals and they defend their trees against intrusion by other koalas. Males have a dark stained scent gland on their chest which they rub against a tree to mark territory. 
A koala about to climb a tree first has a cautionary sniff to make sure the coast is clear. If two adults of the opposite sex are seen in the same tree, it's often a prelude to mating. In the mating season, the male trumpets out his availability as a father. But no matter how hard he bellows, mating only occurs if the female is willing. If she decides she's not in the mood, she soon lets him know. At birth, young koalas are only about twice as long as your fingernail. Usually, only one young is born, although twins have been recorded. With its eyes not yet opened and guided by its sense of smell, the young koala climbs into the mother's pouch and fastens onto one of her two nipples where it feeds for up to seven months. By about four months, its eyes are open and its body is covered by fine hair. At six months, weaning begins. The weaning of a young koala is a most remarkable process. At about four months, the young pokes its head out of its mother's pouch and eats a special mush of partly digested gum leaves that has passed through the mother. It actually eats its mother's fecal matter. But this practice is necessary because it enables the young to obtain the microorganisms it needs to digest the tough gum leaves. Without doing this, the young koala would starve. The young koala leaves the pouch at about seven months, clinging to the mother's stomach or back and by the end of the first year, it is fully weaned with a full coat of fur. Koalas may live for up to 20 years. At present, they are not an endangered species, but this has not always been so. There was a time when hundreds of thousands of them were slaughtered for their fur. In the 20s, a famous Australian scientist said that shooting a koala was the second most barbaric thing that a human could possibly do, since a koala screams like a child when shot. The most barbaric thing would be to do it again, and many did. Now though, wildlife authorities in Australia are keeping a close watch on numbers, and they are fully protected in all states. Today, there are probably about 100,000 koalas in Australia, and the species appears to be in little danger. The platypus is unquestionably Australia's most bizarre mammal. It occurs only in the eastern part of the continent. When it was first collected in about 1797 and taken back to Europe, it was utterly disbelieved. In fact, it was first thought to be the product of some demented Australian taxidermist that had shoved bits of things together. It subsequently turned out to be a very real and most fascinating creature, as you'll see. The platypus is small and lively. Males grow up to 60 centimeters, about as long as your arm. Females are slightly shorter and weigh a bit less. The body is covered with dense, water-repelling fur that traps a film of air when the animal dives, keeping it dry and warm. Adult males have a fang-like spur on each of their hind legs. The venom the spurs contain can kill small animals and cause severe illness in humans. Female platypuses have spurs at birth, but only the males carry them to maturity. Males probably use their spurs in combat during the breeding season, but they may also use them to capture prey. The most noticeable external feature of the platypus is its bill, which looks like a duck's beak. But the platypus's bill is rubbery and supple and extremely sensitive. 
scientists have discovered that the platypus's bill has an enormous number of sensory receptors. In recent studies, zoologists have found that the bill is so sensitive, it can detect the weak electric currents that small underwater creatures generate when they move their muscles. With its eyes, ears, and nostrils closed, a platypus can use this electroreception to help locate its food. Worms, mollusks, insect larvae, and shrimps or yabbies. Adult platypuses don't have any teeth. They grind up their food before swallowing it on horny pads, with the help of debris picked up with the food. A platypus walks on its knuckles. The claws are used mainly for digging, but they also provide most of the thrust for walking. In slow motion, it's easy to see how they move, more like a lizard than a mammal. Platypuses have poor forward vision. Their eyes incline upwards, and although this is great for scanning the sky and riverbanks while swimming on the surface, they have a lot of difficulty seeing where they're going. Here's one relying on instinct to find his way downhill to the river. And in this case, there seems to be some doubt about whether he's going to get there. He made it. Trapped underwater, a platypus would drown within a few minutes. Nevertheless, it is more at home in water than on land. The body is streamlined, and the flattened tail, which is used to store fat, is also used as a brake and stabilizer. A platypus can stay underwater for as long as six minutes, even finding, chewing, and swallowing its food while still submerged. If it's eating something too big for one mouthful, it pulls it apart rises to the surface to chew and swallow, takes a gulp of air, and dives again to find the dropped pieces. It's difficult to estimate how much food a platypus eats in the wild, but in captivity, they seem to have an enormous appetite and eat half their body weight in food in one night. The platypus lives in a burrow on the banks of a river. Except while suckling or during mating, it ignores other platypuses. It's one platypus per burrow. The most exceptional thing about the platypus is that it's a furry animal, a mammal, that lays eggs. The nesting burrow is dug by the female during the breeding season, close to the surface and up to 20 meters, 60 feet, long. The female blocks the passages of the nesting burrow when she's incubating her eggs in the grass-lined nesting chamber. In spring, with the mating urge, the female's mammary glands enlarge. The male becomes very aggressive, the poison glands in his hind legs enlarge, and the poison becomes more toxic. During the courtship display, the female repeatedly swims beneath the male, and the two animals swim in circles. To a zoologist, a platypus is a monotreme, meaning one hull. This is because the platypus has one opening for two functions. The female platypus excretes and gives birth through the one hull near the base of her tail. About 14 days after mating, she lays two soft-shelled spherical eggs about 15 millimeters in diameter, a bit over half an inch. She puts the eggs on her belly and curls around them then doesn't leave the burrow till they're hatched, about seven to 10 days after the eggs first appear. Another unusual feature, unlike most other mammals, the platypus's mammary glands have no teats. The milk seeps to the body surface through pores in the skin, and the young lap it up. 
At birth, the young are blind and naked. By about the seventh day, they're 40 millimeters, just under two inches, and recognizably a platypus. Before weaning, the baby platypus's sole source of nourishment is the milk from its mother. At this time, she develops an enormous appetite. The only platypus to breed successfully in captivity ate about 800 grams of worms and grubs in one feeding, and she only weighed about 900 grams at the time. Baby platypuses are weaned at about four months. They then leave the burrow, going out into the world and adopting the independent, solitary lifestyle of one of the Earth's most remarkable animals. Echidnas, like the platypus, are egg-laying mammals. They are just as strange, just as bizarre, and belong to a very ancient group. They differ in that they're covered in spines instead of fur, but otherwise, they are no less bizarre. 100 million year old platypus like monotremes are known from Australia, but echidnas may not be any older than 60 million years. There are two types. This is the long beaked echidna, which lived in Australia as recently as 40,000 years ago, but now lives only in neighboring Papua New Guinea and Irian Jaya. Very little is known about this rarely filmed, worm eating animal. The reasons for its disappearance from Australia thousands of years ago remain a complete mystery. The second type is the short-beaked echidna, one of Australia's most widely distributed mammals, even though they're very rarely seen. It thrives throughout its range on mainly a diet of ants and termites. The sharp quills are simply modified hairs, which are hollow and break easily. The amount of hair between the spines varies, depending on where the animal lives. In hotter areas, a very spiny, almost hairless form thrives. Down in colder Tasmania, they're a lot hairier. The most spiny individuals live on Kangaroo Island, off the coast of South Australia. Echidnas show many similarities to reptiles. For instance, they walk like them, a kind of awkward, round-shouldered waddle. Echidnas are loners for most of the year, and in their lifetime, they don't tend to range very far. They can also swim, or at least dog paddle, raising their snout every few strokes to breathe, then lowering it again into the water. Echidnas are most vulnerable when they're on their back. If they're frightened, they don't run away. Instead, they dig rapidly straight down, using their forefeet and claws, and their hind legs to move the sand and soil away. They only need to bury half their body, because their spines give them fine overhead protection, and also help to act as anchors to hold them in tight. Once an echidna is firmly dug in, he can hold on with the grip of a barnacle. And the spines provide such an effective camouflage that an echidna is often mistaken for a tussock of grass. An echidna's hearing is acute, although its ears are often hard to see, but its sight is dismal. It can only see fairly close up objects. A few years ago, an experiment was carried out to examine echidna intelligence. In the experiment, 
At first, both switches would dispense food when pressed. Once the animals learned that they could get food by depressing either switch, one switch was made non-functional. At first, the echidnas got frustrated and took their anger out on the non-working switch. Then the switches were reversed, but they soon learned to press the right one. After that, every time the switches were altered, the animals took less and less time to learn which one would deliver the food. Pretty smart. An echidna can vary its body temperature. When it gets very cold and food is hard to find, they can go into a state of torpor, similar to hibernation. Their heart rate can drop to as low as two beats per minute. In such a state, they use up very little energy and therefore need very little food. However, when they come out of this state, they must eat a lot and quickly to make up for the fasting. When finding its way about, an echidna's sensitive snout is very important. Everything is tested by bulldozing with the tapered end of the muzzle. An echidna's tongue is covered with sticky saliva. Food is simply picked up as the tongue darts quickly in and out at about a hundred times a minute, seen here in slow motion. Like adult platypuses, echidnas have no teeth. They have ridges on the back of their tongue that they use to crush food against the roof of their mouth. An echidna is a termite eater or an anteater, depending on where it lives. In drier areas, they prefer termites, probably because three quarters of the body weight of these insects is water. On a diet of termites, echidnas can go for two weeks without drinking, but they do drink sometimes. When a female echidna becomes pregnant, she actually makes her own pouch. It's formed by muscular contractions that cause the abdominal skin to fold in, forming a V-shaped cavity. 17 days after mating, the soft, leathery egg is thought to be laid directly into the pouch. It is incubated for about 10 days. Inside the egg, the baby echidna grows a special egg tooth on its snout so it can tear a hole in the eggshell when the time is right. With its strong front legs, it drags itself around the pouch area until it locates one of the two milk patches. Like the platypus, the mother echidna has no teats. The milk seeps through pores in the skin, just like sweat does. Baby echidnas have a very strong sucking action, using a vigorous body movement, something like the sucking of a tiny piglet. The echidna young is carried in the pouch for about 55 days until it starts to grow spines when, understandably, the mother ejects it. But she continues to suckle it for another three months before it moves off independently to begin again a life cycle that's existed for more than 60 million years. The next animal you're about to see represents one of the biggest tragedies that Australia has to feel some responsibility for. It's the thylacine, or the Tasmanian wolf, sometimes called the Tasmanian tiger. It's not a wolf, it's not a tiger, it's not even a dog, as it sort of looks, except that it's striped. It's a marsupial, like the koala, or like the kangaroo. And yet one of the tragedies of this animal is that we exterminated it. When Europeans first arrived in Australia, the thylacine was confined to Tasmania. And in fact, that was its last stronghold. Unfortunately, with the Europeans came sheep. Sheep mean money, and they have to come first. So when the thylacine, with its delight for lamb chops, had one look at these sheep, although it normally ate kangaroos, this free meat was too much for it. So when it started to gobble up sheep, the thylacine was in trouble. The net effect was that before the turn of the century, the thylacine was practically exterminated. And by 1933, the last animal alive was captured in the bush. And in fact, that animal died in 1936 in a zoo in Hobart, and that was the end of the species, one of the biggest tragedies in Australia. What you are seeing is the only existing film of this species. It lasts about a minute.
Well, the thylacine was certainly one of the tragedies in Australia, and as zoologists, we're, we're wounded by what happened there. We lost one of Australia's more fantastic animals. But the next animal you're about to see, the numbat, or sometimes called the banded anteater because of its peculiar food habits, may be one of Australia's success stories. Already, it's been possible to breed these animals in captivity, something which a while ago was impossible. This has meant that it's been possible to raise young in captivity and anticipate being able to release these into the wild. The program has already been going on for some time now, and it means that in areas where the numbat has become extinct, it's possible to reintroduce this animal and hopefully to establish the populations in areas where they've long since vanished. Numbat is also an endangered species. They're small animals with a body about 24 centimeters long, a bit less than 10 inches. Added to that, they have a bushy tail about 9 centimeters, or 4 inches long. They belong to the marsupial family Myrmecobiidae, which means living on ants. They're territorial animals, moving about in their own defined areas and keeping very much to themselves, except in the mating season. They live in hollow logs and are always searching for food. They have huge appetites and can eat up to their own weight in termites every day. Numbats have a keen sense of smell, which is how they find their food. They settle down to eat termites, completely oblivious to everything else. The numbat's tongue is about 10 centimeters or four inches long, which is half as long as its body. Numbats feed mainly on a type of termite called coptotermes, and there's plenty of these in the areas of Western Australia where numbats live. This is an X-ray film of a numbat feeding. They have up to 52 teeth, more than any other marsupial. But curiously, adult numbats don't appear to chew their food. Here, a juvenile numbat is definitely chewing. Probably, the young use their teeth to chew until they're properly weaned onto an exclusive termite diet. Some Australians refer to the numbat as the banded anteater, because in Australia, termites are often called white ants. However, although numbats do eat ants, these are taken accidentally, simply because they are present near the termites and get caught on the numbat's sticky tongue. When frightened, a numbat will move into a hollow log and hide until the threat is passed. Apart from the threat from man, they are probably most threatened by foxes and carpet snakes. There are plenty of both in the areas where numbats live. Breeding takes place from about midsummer to early autumn, about December to April. No one knows the length of time from conception to birth but it's thought to be about 30 days. Unlike other marsupials, female numbats don't have pouches. Instead, the adult female has a curtain of stiff hairs as the only protection for her growing young. Like all marsupials, young numbats are born in an embryonic state, and they complete their development attached to the mother's teat. These newborn numbats, blind, hairless, and with almost no hind limbs, are about as small as a grain of wheat, incredibly tiny animals. A few weeks after birth, they're still blind, but they're starting to grow hair, and the ears are visible. These ones are still about the size of a human fingernail. The juvenile on this mother's back is probably about five months old. 
the nursing period is about six months or more. Juveniles hold firmly onto the mother's back with their teeth and appear to be of little concern to her. If they drop off, she makes no attempt to help them. After they separate from the teat, the juveniles grow very quickly, moving out of the burrow to find food. They probably breed in their first year. Numbats once lived across the whole southern part of the Australian continent, but they are now endangered and found only in isolated areas of southwestern Australia. Recently, attempts to breed captive individuals have been successful and plans are now being made to reintroduce captive bred animals into areas where they no longer occur. The next group of marsupials that we're going to see are the kangaroos. These are probably the best known of the Australian animals. We are well familiar with the red kangaroo, the giant red kangaroo that bounds across the deserts of dry inland Australia, but we're far less familiar with some of the rarer kinds of kangaroos, little betongs, little various kinds of rat kangaroos, um, hair, hair wallabies, nail tail wallabies, euros, the tree kangaroos, even some kind of kangaroos that live in trees, quokkas, animals with peculiar names that were first mistaken for rats, um, euros, kangaroos that live only in rock piles. There's an enormous variety of kangaroos. In Australia alone, there are at least about 50, and if you include New Guinea, well over 60 different species of kangaroos. So we can only show you a few, but you'll appreciate that these are some of the most unusual Australian animals, and in terms of mammals in general, some of the most unique in the world. Kangaroos were completely unknown in the Western world until the Europeans landed in Australia in the 17th century. Kangaroos must have been quite a shock, the Dutch explorer Willem de Vlaming in 1696 described them in his journal as a kind of rat, as big as a common cat. He had seen one of these little creatures. It's a quokka from Rottnest Island off Western Australia. Captain James Cook first saw a kangaroo in 1770 he wrote about the experience in his diary. I saw myself this morning, a little way off from the ship, one of the animals before spoke of. It was of a light mouse color and the full size of a greyhound and shaped in every respect like one, with a long tail which it carried like a greyhound. In short, I should have taken it for a wild dog, but for its walking or running, in which it jumped like a hare or deer. Its progression is by hopping or jumping seven or eight feet at each hop upon its hind legs only. It was once thought that the kangaroo's tail was used like a third hind leg to help the animal make its enormous jumps. But this film of a moving kangaroo shows that the tail acts instead as a rudder and balancing organ, and it rarely touches the ground. Is this a kangaroo? Yes. It's one of the rat kangaroos, a potteroo. It jumps in exactly the same way as other kangaroos, but also uses its forepaws to turn or stop. This one is a betong, another rat kangaroo. It feeds on fungus, roots, and seeds, which it locates with an extraordinarily keen sense of smell. Here's a kangaroo not found in Australia. It's the forest wallaby, 
of Papua New Guinea. The Parma wallaby was introduced into New Zealand in the mid-1800s, where it soon became a pest. But ironically, it became so rare in Australia by the 1930s that it was feared extinct. The nail-tailed wallaby has a horny spur, rather like a hard fingernail on the end of its tail. Its function is unknown. Interestingly, the African lion has a similar spur on the end of its tail. Being so beautifully equipped for traveling rapidly through open country, you could be excused for presuming that kangaroos would not be found in trees. But some are. This is a tree kangaroo. They live in the northeastern tip of Australia and in the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. Zoologists believe that the ancestors of the modern kangaroos were probably all tree dwellers, but that they left the trees and adapted to life on the ground. However, the ancestors of some, such as these tree kangaroos, returned to live high in the trees again. Living in the branches has meant the tree kangaroos have had to develop a few novel features. For instance, they can move their hind legs independently, and their ears aren't as movable as those of the ground-dwelling kangaroos. They never look too sure of themselves up in the trees. That is, until they decide on a leap like this. All tree kangaroos have this remarkable ability. They can survive vertical leaps of up to 18 meters, almost 60 feet. The familiar gray kangaroos live in more temperate grasslands, but never far from wooded country. Generally, they don't travel alone. They usually gather in mobs of a dozen or sometimes more. Because there are no obvious outward signs when a female kangaroo is pregnant, mystery surrounded their birth for a long time. The first sign that a birth is imminent is when the mother starts intensively cleaning her pouch. This is a sign she'll give birth within 24 hours. She passes her tail forward between her hind legs and rests all the weight of her body on the base of her tail. The baby kangaroo is born wrapped in a fluid-filled envelope, followed by a sack of its waist, which falls to the ground. The tiny creature then breaks quickly out of the envelope and heads directly for the pouch. This baby's only about the size of a peanut. When it gets to the pouch, it burrows in and probably through its sense of smell, locates a teat. The teat then swells in its mouth to make a kind of ball and socket connection that isn't broken for several months. This young kangaroo has become detached from the teat. It's too young to reattach itself and will die. But if the mother has mated shortly after the birth of her young, she may have been storing up a second dormant embryo. If the first stops sucking, the second will start growing and be born shortly after. The young kangaroos, joeys, grow quickly in the pouch, soon climbing out to join the mature adults in grazing before climbing back in again. Some kangaroo mothers carry their young in their pouches for nearly a year. Everybody recognizes the kangaroo as uniquely Australian, but not so the next animal you're about to see, although it's very much a part of the Australian scene. These animals were imported to Australia about the mid-1800s and are still here today. Although they're the tallest of Australia's wild animals, you would be very lucky to ever see one. Central Australia. Arid, inhospitable, 
as hot as the Sahara. Here lives Australia's most unexpected animal, the camel. The ancestors of all camels originated in North America, but they were all gone from there by the end of the Ice Age. Sometime later, in 1840, the first camels arrived in Australia. They were the one-humped Arabian camels. Of a world population estimated at 15 million, only about 20,000 one-humped camels live in a wild state. And all of these are in Australia. They are the descendants of thousands of animals introduced between 1840 and 1907 as beasts of burden. Camels live in herds, ranging from a few animals to several hundred. They occur in a variety of habitats, but they are mainly found in the Sandy Ridge dunes of central and central western Australia. 24 of a special kind of the one-humped Arabian camels, sometimes called dromedaries, were brought to Australia almost 150 years ago. By 1900, the number was 6,000. They are well adapted to desert life. They have a low metabolic rate and a slow turnover of water. They don't begin to sweat until their internal temperature rises above 38 degrees centigrade, almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The camel's hump is probably its most conspicuous feature. It's been known to weigh as much as 20% of its total body weight. Despite popular belief, Water is not stored in the hump, the stomach, or anywhere else. Camel is remarkably efficient in water utilization, sweating and urinating much less than expected. A camel does not drink for the future, but for the past. It drinks only as much water as it has lost since the last watering. The loss is usually small. The fat in the hump of a well-nourished camel represents a food supply for about six months. The legs are long. The neck is long and curved. The ears are small. The eyes have long lashes, and the nostrils can be closed as an additional protection against blown sand. The foot consists of two toes united at the sole by a web of skin. There are horny callocytes on the chest and leg joints. Because of fleshy lips and a rasp-like tongue, a camel can eat hard, thorny food. Camels are about nine feet or three meters long and stand nearly seven feet or 2.2 meters at the shoulder. The time from conception to birth is 12 to 13 months. A female breeds every second year and a single offspring is the rule. A camel's lifespan is 30 to 40 years. Australia's first cameleers were called Afghans, although most of them had never been to Afghanistan, and few even knew where it was. Most of them came from Karachi and Baluchistan in Pakistan. None of their women came with them. Bureaucracy wouldn't allow it. Afghans would often follow dry creek beds to avoid hills on the main tracks. A great deal of the outback would not have been opened had it not been for the Afghans and their camels. Early Australian explorers made extensive use of camels. The last exploration using camels was across the Simpson Desert in Australia's dead heart in 1939. Jack Bija, son of an Afghan, went on the expedition too and took his camels to carry the load. There are now very few camels at work in Australia. These are exceptions.
They are being used to resupply cattlemen at work at Anna Creek, one of Australia's largest cattle stations. It has an area of almost 31,000 square kilometers, or about 12,000 square miles. The cattlemen might be absent from the homestead on the station for up to three months. Motor vehicles have replaced camels. Derelict wagons are a poor reminder of the rich contribution that camels made to opening up a wilderness. Camels in Australia now run wild. They are the healthiest camels in the world. Many have been exported, some to zoos in the United States and even to Saudi Arabia. Unlike the animals we've been looking at until now, all of the mammals, the ones we're about to see are reptiles. These are the crocodiles. They're the cousins of the dinosaurs, the gigantic reptiles that once ruled the whole of the earth. And every now and then, they eat one of us. Crocodiles are feared as killers of humans, loathed, maligned, and very little understood. There are two Australian species, the small, inoffensive freshwater crocodile and the much bigger saltwater crocodile, which can live perfectly well in the sea. This is crocodile country, northwestern Australia, the Northern Territory and North Queensland. Vast, lonely areas of scrub and water where saltwater crocodiles can live for about a hundred years, grow to seven meters in length, more than 20 feet, and get to weigh over a ton. All the way across this northern part of Australia, there are many cave paintings that celebrate the place the crocodile had in Aboriginal culture for thousands of years. The Aborigines painted on the walls of caves and carved animals in rocks just as the Paleolithic hunters of Europe and Africa did. But in Australia, some of the artists are still alive and can explain the significance of the paintings. long, you can see it's a freshwater crocodile because of the uh the long nose here, which at the present time is covered by a termite uh, mound, uh, rather unfortunately, but that's the uh, typical painting of a crocodile in this country by the Aboriginal. And perhaps this one might be anything from a thousand to two thousand years old. A constant companion to Aborigines is the dingo. Until very recently, the crocodile was one of the least studied creatures in Australia, and thousands were slaughtered for their skins between 1946 and 1973, when laws were brought in to protect them. This man, Henry Hanish, was a crocodile hunter for 18 years. In that time, he killed about 1,500 a year, or a total of 27,000 crocodiles. It's around the 12 foot. It's a female, and uh, I would reckon that's somewhere around the top sizes for a female croc. All the years I've been shooting, I, I generally check every croc to see what they are. 
And uh, the biggest female I ever got was 13 foot 6 inches. But hunting to feed an industry eager for crocodile skins, for shoes and handbags, soon reduced the numbers of both saltwater and freshwater crocodiles to danger point. Today, thanks to government protection, their numbers are on the increase. Zoological research goes on in crocodile farms in Papua New Guinea and Australia. On this farm in Papua New Guinea, a long-term program of research was begun in 1969 into the breeding behavior of crocodiles in captivity. Like all experiments, it depends on taking growth measurements. But to measure a crocodile, you first have to catch it. The main diet of these crocs is fish, and the amount of food per croc per feeding is carefully measured. The animals are weighed and measured every six months to check on their progress. The scheme has been a success, and similar farms are planned for the future. 30. Okay. This researcher is trying to encourage his crocodiles to mate, to build their nests, and to hatch out their young in the reserve he has made for them. Saltwater crocodiles begin to mate in October or November. When the monsoon rains arrive, usually in January, the female starts to build a nest, a hollow in the mud or sand filled with grass and leaves. This becomes a sort of compost heap in which 40 to 60 eggs are laid. The small eggs, about seven and a half centimeters or three inches long, are hard shelled. They're covered with mud and packed down. The female guards the nest by sleeping on it, leaving it only to feed, until the young crocodiles hatch after about nine weeks. The young started this squawking while still inside the egg. It's this sound that stimulates the mother to clear away the top of the nest to make it easier for the young to hatch. The calling of the young is also thought to be a key factor in synchronizing the hatching of all the brood at the same time. At birth, the young crocodiles are only about 25 centimeters or 10 inches long and extremely vulnerable to birds, fish, snakes, and most dangerous of all, larger crocodiles. But the mother continues to protect them for several weeks after they hatch. For a time, the young crocodiles live on insects, beetles, snails, frogs, and tiny fish. Later, they'll graduate to a diet of larger fish, birds, and mammals. They leave the nest when they're about one month old, and they never return. Europeans settled this continent 200 years ago. The original Australians, the Aboriginals, arrived much earlier. An eon or so before that came the animals we've seen in this program. But there are many others, all worthy of a closer look. Perhaps another time. <laughs> ¶¶